Now, as you probably already know, we have a great video on inking the sea fire that covers basically all the high-tech ways of doing ink. This, this video is going to concentrate more on somebody who might be a beginner or might be doing their first plane. In this case, we're going to use Ken Thompson's Nobler as our example and do a relatively simple ink job. Try to do it neat and clean, do it crisp, and I'm going to try to show all of the little tricks and tips that will make your first ink job, I hope, a real good one. Now, the bottom line is most people at a low or entry level really try to avoid doing ink because they think it's real complicated, real difficult to do. It really isn't. Whether you're building an entry level plane, a half A even, or some kind of a semi-scale plane, it's nice to be able to put the flap lines, the ailerons, some of the little rivet heads, gas caps. Also, you can use ink as a way of hiding mistakes. If there's a terrible mistake somewhere on your plane, you can kind of put a little gas cap, some Letraset, some way you can use it not only to dress up a model but to disguise little errors. Now my name is Wendy Ertnowski and I'm going to be trying to show some of the things in a very simplified way that may or may not be difficult to an entry level person or somebody that wants to do this. For people that have been modeling years and years and years, you know some parts of inking can be very frustrating. Now some of the tricks, some of the tips that I've developed, I've learned from other people, many other people, and I've tried to consolidate all the information into one really doable tape. I've written about this in columns, I've had things published, and I've done the more complex videos like the Sea Fire and Spitfire. But I think most people would benefit the most from a real basic little dissertation and how to do a nice ink job. And an ink job, by the way, shouldn't be intimidating. It shouldn't be so high tech that you're afraid to do it. Now, just some of the things over the years that I've found is some of the complex, really difficult ink work, like on this ship, this, this could take probably 20, 30 hours of figuring out the little angles and where you want things. And one of the things, and I want to give Steve Busso full credit for this idea, is what he did is he made up a scale copy of the plan form of the airplane, top view and side view. And then he laid out his ink ahead of time before he ever got to do the plane, he laid it all out. Now Mike Rogers again, he did the same thing. Measured out one-third the span, one-fourth the span. Had this all figured out and laid out ahead of time rather than doing it on the plane itself. Now this is a ship that Walt Brownell is doing and you can see some of the little sketches. These are like the Steve, they might even be the Steve Busso sketches. He made them for all his designs. And he used to give them, basically give them away so that people could figure out all their inking. The first thing you don't want to do is make things and turn the top of the wing, say, into something that looks like, uh, you know, not scale or not prototypical. So the first thing you might want to do is take a look at some magazines and see just what kind of ink lines and panel lines look like on a real plane. Now, even if you're not making a scale model, if you're not even considering a scale model. Look at how a scale model, how do panel lines normally break? You know, some people just take and just randomly put things and they go get these architectural uh, little green templates and they start doing things without realizing that isn't prototypical, it isn't scale. Not only, even if it's not a scale model, it doesn't look right, it looks out of place. So my feeling is you can pick up a lot of good information off of these little books. Now I in particular save all the things relating to Spitfires but it isn't real expensive, it isn't hard to do and if you're really on a budget you can even go to a local library and just pick up some books basically like this that show how a, how a real aircraft would come apart, how Zeus fittings would lay out, where panel lines typically would be. Now here's a good example of a very simple but effective ink line job and what he's done, this is a plane that the tank compartment right here comes out, you can see there's a brake line there, he's used the actual brake line 
as part of the ink pattern and that's always a good way to disguise a break pattern or a cowl separation line. Now Ski Dombrowski, the reason I'm showing his plane here, Ski Dombrowski taught me something years ago about inking. And this plane, this is his lace maker, a concourse winner. He went and looked at hundreds of different layouts of how a real plane from the 30s, a radial engine plane, would have its brake lines and its port lines. And it was so effective. It's one of the things that when you look at it, it instantly impacts you that it's correct. Now, because we're basically going to be doing a nobler, we're going to try to carry on some of the traditions and try to combine what would be the paneling on a semi-scale plane and combine that with the traditional look of the noblers of the past. And it, when it comes to that time of year that they lay all the planes down in appearance rows and you have a really neat ink job, very neat, business-like, you can be sure it adds something to the impact of a plane on the judges. Now this was my first ink job that won the concourse award and you can see what I did I kept it relatively simple but neat each lettering was on a separate line I did a little logo used used letter sets but ba the basic simple effective and it worked now you also can take advantage of the fact that on a red plane say you can use white ink or black ink and you can combine them to make some very effective little semi-scale or just illusional little fantasy panel lines. Now Lou Dutke used to, ha used to build basically the same airplane over and over and over again and he used to have a very set way of laying out the ink. There would be a certain amount of lines on each wing, a certain angle, a certain amount of rivet heads. Everything was almost like it was pre-programmed in and if you choose to do that what you really want to do is get it right the first time I don't know if on the video you can see the inking on this there's some some white ink some black ink it really is very thin inking very thin and delicate now another thing I tried to do this was an 85 concourse winner I took the trim lines and made ink so that it accented the trim lines and I tried to do what it, what amounted at the time to be a semi-scale what I thought was semi-scale but again I don't consider this to be real effective had I looked at some books I would have known that these panel lines would be nothing like that now this is a ship from 1984 if you look real close you'll see it has a geodetic wing the ribs are in on an angle this was one of my first attempts at making a geodetic wing, but I tried to carry the idea that everything had a triangle or an angle in the trim work, in the ink work, the filleting. You notice there's some pretty, almost a fillet like on a little cardinal here. Really some nice detailing, but, but none of it is really prototypical in any way, and I think that's why this plane, in my estimation, missed the mark, even though I spent hundreds of hours on it. Frank McMillan's planes over the years have been absolutely classic and Frank is the one that turned me on to the idea of looking at the plans to a real plane. Now Frank, even though this isn't a semi-scale plane, the ink work is very, very prototypical. Same on his Quadrant series. And the point here is it doesn't take a lot of ink work. Typically in the past, the Noblers of the past would always have the little flap or aileron little uh, slices out of the flap and on the rudder and things and it takes very little to make it look real good you can get ninety percent of the effect of doing it in ten percent of the time and then to really do a slam dunk job it takes the other ninety percent and one of the best people i've ever seen with ink aside from steve busso is definitely vic macaluso all of his panel lines are as neat as a pin he did a wonderful demo for us on one of the stunt forms that if you haven't seen you might want to check out vic i take my hat off to you you're one of the kings of ink now just look at some of the intricate little details they're accented by the ink work 
Now, worth mentioning is Bill Rich's series of SV11s have some really nicely detailed, electrocetted, very, very effective inking in a minimum amount of time. Another master at the ink pen, Ted, Fid Ted Fancher. Check out on some of his planes how what I particularly like is how to, the panel lines run right around the front of the wing. Very, very nice touch. Here's a real good example. One of the things Jim was real, real good at. He used to take a pen and go around all his lettering and all his trim with a wide ink pen. Edge everything out, all the stars. Always had an edge around. Very nice. A concourse winner in 1988. And we're just waiting for Kenny to get here and we can get started on actually laying down some ink. That is several different ways to prepare a plane for ink. Number one, you can put the ink underneath all the clear, and at the same, which is the way I've done all of the big Spitfires and Strega and whatever. But the other way to do it, you can put some of the clear on, and then you can bury that in individual coats of clear, and that's the way Ken's chosen to do his nobler. And we picked a real nice day for doing the, uh, the sand out of the clear. We don't know if we're going to get the whole thing done, part of it, or whatever. But you can see he's not working under the worst conditions in the world. This is, in fact, really pretty nice. Not many people have to really endure the hardship of working under a beach umbrella here. You're really working hard, huh, Ken? Yeah, really working hard. It's terrible. Now, Ken has about, I guess, maybe even more than half of the clear on here. And we're trying to accomplish two things at once. By knocking down these coats of clear, getting these edges nice and smooth, these could still use a little more, probably. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. You can still feel the edge just a little bit. Oh, what definitely we're, feel it. What we're trying real, really hard not to do is break through into the candy apple, because that is difficult to, to do to repair on. This would be very easy if you went through. The lettering would even be relatively easy this. to touch up. Okay, you went, went through, through in a corner? Okay, right. but see the tip weight box, you can spray the whole thing. Yeah. You don't have to end it anywhere. And if you have a little bit extra on a tip weight box, who cares? Now, a couple of things we learned right away is you don't want to do this in the sun. The reason for doing this outside is so we're not in a confined area breathing this stuff in. This is Sickens M600. It's not, not the best thing in the world to be breathing gallons and gallons of it in. And second of all, it's just a nice day. Trying to enjoy the Jersey summer. So before we go any further, we want to do one panel, get one panel sanded totally out, and then we can go practice a little bit of the ink on it. Now some really good tips while Ken is out there preparing one of the wing panels for this. What I try to do, very simple, I have two drawers that go into my little from the garbage drawer over there. And they're dedicated drawers, so that everything that would go with a letter set would go in this drawer, all lettering. And I have all different combinations of things, the Tom Lay jobs. I think John Brodeck eventually is going to come out with some nice lettering of his own. I keep the ones for the Spitfire in a separate bag, and you can see the reason for saving all these, even though it's not a, it's not a good idea to try to use up old ones, what happens is when you get a new set and you need one more N or one more M or one more... One AMA, let, you could go crazy. So by having these extras, it's really a good idea to have them just for the extra little letters and O's and dots and whatever. Also, the templates for the ink lines, I have, and of course I have all the things, the things, little, little notes and tips people send me. This is from Giorgino. This was from uh, John Brodeck had sent some little things. I save all these pens that I've tried couple of things. This is the kind of ink that I use, and you want to use the ink that's made. Now see, this is made for paper. You want to use the one that says it's made for film. And if you look through here, see as I say that, here we go. Now Bob Martens has cleaned my pens for me, so we should have some real good luck. I'm a real coward. I send all the pens to Bob Martens once a year for a good cleaning. This is the ink, that's the ink of choice. Either white, see it says right here, for film. 
this is the ink that works the best that I've found. You also have a selection of pens. The tips are thicker, thinner, as the need may be. In a real pinch, or if you were doing this on a real budget, one, say, a 1.0 or a 0 0.80 for your thick lines, and maybe a 0.35 for your thin lines, would get you through. But, of course, when you're doing ultra-detailed work, having a lot of different ones is nice. By the way, the idea of doing all different kind of lines, all different thicknesses, adds a lot of interest to it. Now, I also have, in various envelopes, nose art, a whole selection of these, and these are available in staples, drafting supply stores. This is what you really want to try to avoid. See, this is an architectural one, and it has pianos, and this is what years ago I used to do, is put pianos on the wing and shrubbery, and this is where it really gets silly when you get into that. There's a bunch of them that I found were less than useful. These I haven't found any real use for. The lettering doesn't look like an, air, like an airplane would look. French curves are handy to have if you want to do curved lines. A set of these is real inexpensive. Now, every template that you have, you can see I have three layers of eighth-inch tape. And what that does, that holds it up off the wing so that ink doesn't bleed underneath. No matter what template you're using, some templates come that way, but you want to basically get the template up off the wing so that there's a little gap, so that if ink does flow, it doesn't go underneath there and smear. So that's one consideration when you buy templates, is try to buy them. Now some of them, like this one here, you can buy, it has no relief, well, I'll call it relief. Unless you hold it upside down and then it has an angle back cut. An angle back cut is the same as having tape. Some of them, I've even gone so far as to put little strips of cork on where I didn't want it to touch the finish. At least three layers of eighth inch tape is a good idea to hold it up off, off the wing. And over the years, now keep in mind, I've been doing this for 45 years, I've gotten, and here's the one that just came from John Brodak not so long ago. In fact, we haven't even used this one yet. And the reason I have the sandpapers here is so this doesn't slide when you're working by yourself. This is a real nice one. And it has, we're going to try to use this, in fact, some, some rivet lines. This is from Top Flight. I got this from John Brodak. He might stock these, I don't even know. It has rivet lines, fuel tank. A lot of nice little stuff. Anyway, whatever the selection, you can you can pretty much go to the store and just pick up for maybe eight ten dollars enough to really do a nice job on a plane. But then another cute little trick we do: we save all our cockpit stuff in one envelope. The reason for that is anytime anybody's going to do a cockpit, we have instruments in every size. We had them scaled up and scaled down, so we have a hundred different sizes here. Anyway, that's my first suggestion, is get yourself a couple of boxes or one box, box for doing all your little detail stuff. Now what Ken did a real, real careful job of, and I want to emphasize this is always a good way to do it. Everything is block sanded down with 1200. He wiped it clean with M600. And from this point on, you want to wash or clean your hands relatively often or use rubber gloves whichever you're more comfortable with because what's going to happen now is anywhere there's a fingerprint on the plane the ink is not going to be happy sticking there's a couple of ways of getting around that talcum powder is one but you can see this surface has been blocked down almost to the point there's still some little craters in it but there's going to be more clear put on top but right now we want to lay out get some idea of exactly what we want to do in terms of ink lines and making a plan ahead of time is always a good idea if you're so inclined to do it. We laid out a little just to see the thicknesses of the lines. A thin one, medium one, again they come in all thicknesses. You can go up as high as, a, I think I have one that's 120. bigger the number, the thicker the line. I mark the pens that have black ink with black tape. The other ones of course have white ink in them. So, with this we want to lay out a little test panel. Now even though this little template has little little reliefs that would, that would normally hold it up off a flat table, because we're working on a curved surface, it's always good to put two or three layers of masking tape, and what that does, it holds the template up off the surface so ink doesn't run underneath it. Three layers of tape will usually do it. Now this is a 
a top flight scale warbird template that I got from John Brodeck that has rivet heads, gas caps, fuel accesses, triangles. This is one of the templates we're going to be using. But there's several other ones and we're just going to fish through here. I had made them out of plywood and I'm looking for one in particular here that I thought I had. I had one. These, these work real well too. You can cut the templates apart. And if you need to, in the very beginning, if you need to have a little help if you're working by yourself or you can always put a little bit of tape around them to hold them in place. I call that training wheels and that'll work out real well. Tape along the edge of course like I said before this is a good little help if you're working alone or if you just need the first or second time you do this. The whole trick is to try to hold the pen straight up and down relatively straight up and down and maintain one nice flow to the ink. Okay, now what Ken's going to do is lay out. Typically an airplane would have an access panel out here for the wiring, but it, we're really not making it. It's certainly not a totally scale plane, so you can kind of look around. If you have a flaw somewhere in the paint, this is a good way to hide the flaw in the paint. It's one way that you may as well take advantage of the fact that you're going to have a little something to take your eye off, say if you have your fingernail mark in a paint or something like that. Actually the bottom looks a lot better than the top, so... Oh, that's always the way. That won't help. Nobody that's ever built a plane has ever made it that the top is better than the bottom. Okay, now it's a good idea to practice on the bottom before you go on the top. Again, if you do make a mistake with ink, there's two possibilities. You can have alcohol and Q-tips ready and wipe it right off. Uh, that's one way, but I'm, I'm really not in favor of that. What I like to do is if you have an error, let it dry and get a brand new XL blade and just scrape it off. Never try to sand it off. Sanding it off is a problem. Okay, now the idea is to go around and then right at the end pull the pen right up off. And I got a little thing I'll have to scrape off. Okay, but that's as good we can show the practice spots. Okay, see now what Ken has done and sure he didn't do it on purpose but anyway this is what happens is you always wind up with a little mistake if you go to wipe that now it smears and everything but if you let it dry a brand new blade will just take it right off and this is where it's helpful to have some of those uh, like Spitfire books or something that shows uh, where the real scale panel lines would be on a plane and we're going to try to make this symmetrical so obviously we'll get one in the other wingtip as a good start. Now it's always good to let that one dry before you try to touch it up. Go to the next one, let it dry. The tape is a good trick. Otherwise when you're holding it at the last minute sometimes you just grab it with your thumb or whatever. If you need new tape, the roll is... I just need to think. All right, and you just want to get the symmetry right here. The idea, too, is to keep a paper towel around, and at the end of doing a couple or one, is just take the tip like this and get the, the whatever clear you scrape up tends to build up on the tip of the pen. Now, if the pen stops writing for some reason, you want to just very gently get the ball, the ball pumps ink down to the tip, get it starting to click again, and then go on to the next line. Now we just have some video here of Tsunami that we've been watching just to get some idea for some scale panel lines. Okay, so that's, you've got this kind of, now see this one you don't have a little problem with. So by now that, we'll do the two on a tail and then we'll go back and make that correction. The most important thing with ink is if you know how to make the corrections, it's a lot better almost than, than not making the errors because then you can go ahead full speed and you're not intimidated by any of this. But make sure it's totally dry before you try to scrape it off. And this is where the, the little artist takes over and you can kind of, like I said, look at videos, look at real airplanes, look at panel lines. Now again, this is this is Russ Hunsberger's plane. It just personal taste in ink is a funny thing. You can go for a million lines, a million different things, 
or you can make it as simple as possible. Now again, back up to Strega, which is a relatively simple plane, relatively simple lettering, simple hatches, or you can get into the uh, the most immense five different colors of ink, carrier hooks, whatever, whatever you happen to want to convey in your artwork. At the little, just very gently, go gently. You can feel the difference in the texture when you're removing the ink. Much easier to do that than alcohol and Q-tips. Okay. Yeah, it's gone. Much better to do it that way. Just don't sneeze. Now we want to try some some rivet heads, so of course we got to put that tape to hold this pattern up. Same thing, and this template, by the way, has a lot of interesting things. Thin rivets, thick rivets, this would be a good one. I'm going to do this on a commercial basis. A dollar a dot. Okay now, there you go. Now one of the choices you always have with ink, if you, you can do a part of it, we're doing the bottom first of course, practice on the bottom, but you can see how does it look with every other one done. Also when you're doing this, you're not dragging your hand through wet ink. You don't want to start at this end and then be always going back over your hand. You want to always work down the way he's working, so as soon as you're done with one spot, you go on to the next edge. You really just don't want to, you got to kind of think it through a little bit so you don't wind up going back through your own fingerprints constantly. This just makes it a little bit easier. You have to hold that pen vertical. It is a little touch and this is why you do the bottom first. Doing the bottom first is, no matter what it is, it's a good technique. It's basic sound technology that works for everybody. Now one of the good points to make is anything you don't like on the bottom, and we have a couple little things here that we weren't crazy about, we're just going to scrape them off when we're done here. But we get the bottom as a little test bed to see how you're going to like it before you flip it over and start inking the top. Let's see how that looks. Okay, now with these templates, you always have a choice. You can fill the rivets in. You can make Zeus fittings out of them by putting a little crosshair in it. You can add the dots to the access lines. What we tried to see if we like it is to do every other one. Try to give it a little, like a realistic look. But of course, you could do every one. You can, there's just a million endless choices when it comes to this stuff. And now what Ken's going to try to do is simulate the same thing on the tail, but with the smaller rivets. Smaller and closer spaced. It's working out okay? Yeah. How do they get the ink lines on real planes? They're panel lines. It's where the skins join. You go look at a real plane, you'll see. It's pretty predictable. They can't make a whole wing out of one piece of metal. Even you can't. Even with your supernatural powers of persuasion. Okay, now in here, one of the things we're trying to do is continue a straight line, so possibly you can do the whole thing in one stroke. Well, you can't really, because the spacing is... Yeah. I'm trying to drop these. You know what you're going to do? Cut the, cut the thing in half. Nah. You got, otherwise, you can, you're going to make yourself crazy. I'm crazy? He hasn't noticed all mine are all cut up. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, it goes pretty quick though, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, this is get, not all time consuming. It's you got to build up a little rhythm, a little speed. And in this case, boy, the whole thing is due to bottom. There goes President, uh, President Inkline. 
How's that going? Nice? Yeah, it's going real quick now. Okay, good. It gets, gets faster and faster the, the, as soon as you build up your technique. Okay, what Ken did, he kind of improvised a little bit, and that's that's half the fun of doing this, is invent them, invent little gizmos and things as you go along. Okay, you feel confident to flip this over and... Uh, yeah, I think we're ready to do the other side. Okay, let's flip it over, clear the deck, and uh, that's going to work a little different on the top because of the lettering. We have to figure how that's going to work. Flipping things over at my place is easier than flipping things over. And what we did, there's a little glitch in the lettering there where it's edged through. And we want the little rivet heads to uh, just kind of kind of take your eye off the fact there's a little imperfection there. You blackening them in as you go along? Uh-huh. Okay, yeah, that would even be better. I guess I didn't do that on the bottom. You no, know, you can go back and do that freehand even. You don't even need the template. Just do it freehand. Now, another thing is when you're making dots, big dots like this, it tends to take longer for the ink to dry. So what you're trying to do is lay it out in such a way that you're not bringing your hand back through the ink all the time. And it's amazing, once you get one drop of this ink on your hands, it's on there until the skin wears off. I have to okay, now, here. yeah. Now, another trick, when you're doing this kind of stuff, if you start, he left the last one to go here, but if you start on this one, you don't want to come over here and start one over. You want them to be symmetrical. And if you screw it up, then what it means is you have to go back and do every one. <laughs> You know how many rivet heads there are on that sea fire? I was doing this for two weeks. And there's a lot of, of Zeus fasteners. Oh, on a real Oh yeah. Well they don't know that at appearance judging. You can go back and recorrect, add pretty much if you really want to be a fanatic, scrape things off and start all over again, but this this template seems to put a nice nice set of rivets on, and I've had my own little improvised way of doing this, but this definitely is an improvement over the old Seafire way. Most of those were done by hand. This is a lot better than using a ruler. Yeah, I did it with a ruler, and it was it was really time consuming and labor intensive. Now I could put one of these long ones. Okay, now you have a right in. yeah, just center it. I want to center it on this, not center it on that. I don't care whether it's centered on the box or not. In fact, it's a little better if it isn't. But once you get going, it's... It Why am I glad I did the bottom first? Hmm. <laughs> that guy must be a genius. <laughs> oh. I wish I could take full credit for that idea. It must be just about right. Now what you can do when you do the elevators and tail, you can use the thinner pen so that the rivets are a thinner, you know, they're not all, that's one of my tricks is always make the ink lines. Ah! Look at that. Oh, I'm glad we got that one on video. Okay, let it dry. There's no problem. Let me dry this pretty quickly. Okay, you want to show that trick with the hair dryer? Okay. Just hair dryer it off so you can get the scraping done. This allows you to just go back and scrape that off with the razor. Don't try this at home. Just remember, it's better to be able to know how to fix mistakes than not make mistakes at all. That works good, doesn't it? Yeah, pretty good. Now, if you want to kind of hide that even more, put a couple of rivets around the end of it. That, that, where that is, yeah. 
put rivets in it was similar to what you have in this access panel. Just too easy to do one too many. Yeah, the golden rule with Letra sets and inclines is if you have a choice, and the choice is one too many or one not enough, one not enough is always better. The little rivet heads kind of take your eye off any imperfection that, or any misalignment. I'm just kind of visually dividing these little spaces in yeah. half. And now we're almost at the end of this session. We're going to pick this up tomorrow with uh, doing some letter sets, finalizing uh, whatever we're going to do, and then shooting some more clear. So good idea, too, not to do this for too long. You really do go blind after a while. Well, these things that take a lot of concentration, they eat up your energy. They yeah, you get them. your eyes, you get eye strain from doing this. But. Yeah, huh. that's just about the right amount of junk. That's that's it, because don't forget you got AMA numbers and you got Letra sets still. And don't forget to do the rudder. Otherwise, it's going to look hokey that you don't have anything on the rudder. It's not going to match. Do figure out how how many how many bands you're doing down here, and do the same equivalent bands up there. Up here and here. Now it's a good idea if you're going to do similar things top and bottom that you line them up. You wouldn't want to do this rib on the top and this rib on the bottom if if it's practical. I think that makes it just a little more uh, workmanlike anyway. Seeing if you did nothing back here, then it just wouldn't match. You got, it, it's always something to keep in mind that have a balanced presentation where everything kind of matches, everything ties into each other. That's why I think it's be important to get some some on that rudder anyway. So I have to get purple pants when I fly this. It's the only kind I ever wear. I can give you my old tweener shirt. <laughs> Karen bought me this shirt to look like I escaped from prison. Boy, that used to be such a big thing years ago. Everybody had to have shirts that matched their planes. Now it's. I guess we've just outgrown it. There was a time when everybody used to buy new sneakers and not wear them until you flew at the Nats and you get out there and all of a sudden your bunions are hurting, your corns, the laces you trip on. Always breaking the shoes at home. Nah, nobody wears white shoes anymore. I haven't, I gotta look at the picture, maybe I did. I'm probably the last one left. Well, you were doing white pants. <laughs> yeah, this is not... This is 1998, just to show you how crazy. Nice Letra set job. Look at this, shirt and pants that match. The plane, Ted Fancher. Well, I don't know, nice shirt, nice pants. Jimmy Cassell, striped shirt. Casmanato. Put his the name of his country, Japan, on his shirt. Hey, Paul Walker, I don't know. Did that ever go out of style? Not sure. I guess it was important to have the shirts match here. Look at this nonsense. Now, it's hard to find a shirt to match Paul Walker's plan. Well, hey, that's the beauty of the whole hobby, whatever turns you on. Now, it wasn't practical to do full lines because you couldn't bend the template enough. It just wasn't practical. You do well, half and half? No, they, they start and stop in different places. It's oh, okay. Not a, it's not an exact measurement. All right, and if you're doing every other one, and obviously you could put like two on there, well, okay. Now you still have one side of the elevators to do. 
And one dot to add over here. I one dot to add, dot. okay. All right, you're closing in on it. Another bright day in the world of inking the Nobla. We want to do a little bit of the detailing anyway with white ink, but any kind of ink that you buy, make sure it says on it for paper and film. If the word film isn't on there, it's not going to work as well as the ink that's made to go on film. On mylar, right? Okay, Kenny's trying to work in a vertical position, which is very difficult, and of course, one dot doesn't line up, so you hit it with a hair dryer, get a brand new XL blade again, just scrape that out. Now you're going to have trouble getting it right in line. You ought to do it by hand. It's easier to do it by hand than through the template, I think. you see it or you want to turn it on its side? I like working on a side better. I think I got this. Bingo. <laughs> what a liar. <laughs> so were you able to get a hold of that guy who lettered the uh, GBs for me? Yeah, he'll be over this afternoon. You look so intense. <laughs> oh, I am intense. You don't have me fooled. <laughs> the white ink's a little more difficult to get on this, huh? It's a lot more difficult. It just doesn't want to do the right thing. Not willingly. Willingly. You have to coax it. <laughs> All part of the fun. Okay, you kind of happy with this now? Oh, you got you to gotta constantly be looking back and forth to see if you're going to add what you're going to add and how much you're going to add before we do the numbers. But I guess you want to start the numbers? Well, I'm going to do something around this tip weight box. Put some rivet heads around it. But I don't know whether to do them in... Where's the tip weight box? Put some, put some detailing around the, the bolt. See, I got a little... You got a little ginch that you have to fix? Yeah, it's... The silver is coming through. Why don't you just put rivet heads around the right whole there. thing? The whole thing. But I should probably use dark ones and not white ones. Right? Yeah, I would use dark ones. Then it won't be so outstanding. I use some dark rivet heads. Just you know, you want to take. Yeah, you want to take your eye off of this. Put some around. Yeah, that's good. Okay. These guys. Just do them like rivet heads. As soon as you put the clear on those, they'll jump out a lot more than, you know, when they're just dull like this. You want to put tape on that or you're just going to do that freehand? I'm going to do it freehand. Get a piece of paper if it's starting to dry up. What happens? It'll dry up, and just put a line on a paper yeah, first. Want to do it? All right, get a little piece of where we had paper over here. This happens to be. See, the paper moves if you don't have it taped down. Tape it down now. Get a little line. Okay, now you can use it. That's a good tip to have on a video too, for somebody who wants to get their first inking job. There we go. All right, you're back. See, that's one of the biggest things. If you if you start doing ink and it gets frustrating, you want to know what you can do to kind of correct it or make it better, and you know not to get frustrated. It just takes time to get a little technique. Well, so far, everything has been at least somewhat correctable. So. And what Kenny did is take that riveting template and cut it up into smaller pieces that are a little more, a little easier to manage. Let me say, we got this one cut for these little 
guys this one if you want to do big rivets you could just cut the whole strip right off how's that look it's okay oh yeah okay now I'll connect the dots across here when it dries in now because we want to test the weather we want to put clear on top of this I went outside sprayed a coat I want to let this dry for about a half an hour make sure we don't have a problem with the paint clouding up fogging up although it seems like a pretty reasonable day out there so I was ambidextrous we've done on the whole plane now what Kenny did he wasn't happy with the rivet spacing around the canopy so he's scratching that off And that's one of the nice things about ink. You really, you really do have uh, a little bit of forgiveness anyway. Certainly not infinite, but there's definitely some. And it looks like from the way that's drying up, like we have a halfway decent day to put the clear on this. So just say our prayers. Yeah, that's one of the things if you, if you scratch through down into the substrate, White ink is a good way to touch that up. Stealth lettering. Let's see how the cockpit came out. You can even put one of those little Spitfire windows on your cockpit if you want, those little uh, air vents. Okay, we're just doing a little walk around. He's got his numbers on here now. This is a cute little thing he put on here. A little, uh, little windy smiley face that says, whoops. That's where the you know, can of Bondo or whatever the hell it was fell on a tail. Another perfect way. Yeah, this, this hatch up here came out nice, Ken. Well, See I made it, a little rectangular one over on this yeah. side. I like it actually. I like it a little better. Now we're going to start on Electroset part of this job. The gas cap came out nice too. But this is something you can practice on paper. You can improvise. You can do at your own uh, speed, at your own... Have to really. That. Yeah. Now what we're going to do is lay out just a few Electrosets on this. We're trying to keep this as classic looking as possible, not turning it into a uh, dragster or something. And what we always do is all the people that use the letter set box, we save all the extra ones. So at a time like this when you only need a couple, you don't have to go crazy. And we got them in here. This is the Strega ones, white ones. There should be some white. There should be some decals. And all yeah, that. there's yeah, cockpit well. stuff. But Now a couple things. Even though letter sets do dry out and they get harder and harder to rub off with age, a couple little tips. In my case, I, like, I think if you have a choice, a few not enough, again, is better than too many. That's tip number one. Tip number two, use the newest ones possible. Or go out and pay $12 or $15 for a single sheet. In this case, since we're not using that many of them, you probably won't even need a whole sheet. But we have all these choices. And I want to put this on here, too. This, this cost me $25 to find this out. Dennis Toth had used these. These are letter sets that you make. I couldn't get them to work. Dennis said his worked okay. I didn't have any luck with them, but that doesn't mean they don't work. But try it yourself, or if you want to try it for free, I'll send you the thing for free, and you try it. Basically, didn't work for me. So maybe I can save you 25 bucks. But you can see what happens now in doing the Spitfire and all the other planes. A lot of letters are left over. So in this case, if you want to write Pilot Ken Thompson, well, you don't want to buy a $14 sheet just for 10 letters. And even though, Kenny, a lot of these look the same, they're not. See, if you look at them close, you can't really steal an O from here. A lot of them look real close, but when you put them on a plane, you see it's a totally different looking thing. And we got a bunch of big ones, and 
probably a thousand here from years of years of working on stuff. But always save the old ones, especially if you're a cheap like I am. And Kenny is fitting right into my game plan here. I'm <laughs> cheap be these cash. Cheap beyond belief. <laughs> All right. Anyway, we're having. Uh, we're hoping we're going to be out there painting some clear. Now, the other thing I want to mention is this is important too. What we're going to do is when we go outside, we got the gun set up for clear. I've already tested the tip weight box and the cal. Is we just want to cover the letter sets with maybe one or two or three coats of clear, and then go back and put a coat of clear on a whole plane. But I want extra right on the, and in this case we want to put some extra on the letters too. Up around here, a little extra clear around here, clear around here, and then one wet coat on the whole plane. Same thing with the tail, just go over here. In fact, on the top you'll probably put a little bit extra around here. As many coats as you think you need to cover it. And then just put the remainder of the clear. We have about a half a quarter clear to put on here. And we'll just put the top coat on. And I hope this Saturday we're going to fly this puppy. I'm ready to fly. But Brodak's sitting there waiting to fly too. All right, you figure out what you're going to do here? No. That's, that's the... Now one of the techniques you can use is, you notice there's wax paper with letter sets. What you can do, I'll just do a little demonstration here, is you pre-release. And that means you got to practice on some of your old ones. And the older they are, the harder they are to get off. Is just go real slow, real slow, real slow, till it's almost, it'll turn white, almost ready to release. And then move it up to the plane and press it down. If not, you're going to wind up with dents, called letra dents. Another little tip is, of all the brands that are made, the only ones I ever really have good luck with is Letra Set. They don't really melt as quickly as the other cheaper brands. I don't know what the chemical reason for that is, but Letra Sets should always have a, a dry coat of clear and let it dry, another coat dry, another, maybe three coats dry before you put real clear on top of a real wet coat. Now you can see what I've done is I've used a ballpoint pen to release the little ones. They make special Letra Set releasing tools. I know we have them. Who knows? Oh, here it is. They make this tool. It's about 10 bucks, I think. And it has different... It's got a ball that's on a spring. And this tension is controlled by this number. You can just rotate this and it turns into a lighter and lighter pressure. But for some reason, I never have good luck with these and I always wind up with a ballpoint pen. Again, you can see the ones that I've used already. These are from the Spitfire. They're all done with a pen. But again, you try both. There's no real magic way of doing this other than just give it, give it a try with your personal skill level and your amount of pressure. You ready to go there, Mr. Ken? Ah. Uh. You figure out what you want to do here? I don't see steps and no step type stuff in here. The Tom Lay ones, by the way, I didn't mention that, the Tom Lay sheets that are left over they should all be in one pack. They should have some steps and no steps. They have the letters laid out for you already. I don't know if we have any. This is a Tom Lay thing. But obviously somebody used up this, this sheet already. Okay. By the way, that's a good point. Tom Lay's stuff is really one of the best because you don't have to you don't have to go crazy laying it out yourself. Yeah, we don't have any. That makes that easy. You can look in this hole. This is why we save everything. It could be that, you know what might have happened? The last guy that used the letter sets used up all of those steps. I just write it out with, you know, with your own. They're not going to have your name in there anyway. You just write no step out with the letters. Ah, that is a choice of... <laughs> You know what? That's Left the way it always is. Right. The guy before you always uses up the two dots on the T's or whatever it is that you need. That's the way it is, baby. Not in the, not in the world I live See, in. See all I the choices you have here. Elsewhere. Choices within choices. All right, that's half the fun. This is how you personalize the plane. So that you're the only one that knows. Now, a couple of tips. Always lay out a piece of mask and tape to use as your line and I always like to even though you can reference off the letters reference off the dots one letter at a time and it's better to go back and forth five times and not put a dent in a plane than put a big dent it's just real 
the older they get, the more they want to dent. These are pretty good. Okay, you getting that? Yeah. Okay. Again, this is just one of those things that Now, if you want to peel it up, for some reason, you just take that tape, put tape over it, and pull it up real slow. And usually that'll, that'll get it off. Yeah. Second choice would be to get one of those brand new XL blades and pull it up that way. The tape acts as a good guideline, though. Now, if you're happy with that, just take the tape off nice and slow so you don't put a ginch in that, and go over to the other side so you have it on both sides. It's going pretty straightforward here. Yeah. You're not having any trouble putting dents in? If you do, just switch to another sheet because all it's telling you is that it's really old and the real I'm old just, ones don't want to stick. Just getting away with it here. Okay. Fantastic. I, I don't think it's possible to do this without any dents. But the... No, but you know, just try to minimize them, that's all. feel it when it dents and there's no if friends or... Oh yeah, you can. But it really does dress it up just a little bit. You gotta scrape you get the little ones that yeah. stick even though you don't want them to stick. as we're doing some ink on this video one of the things that goes without saying these are done this is on a separate video that's available it's painted white and then the outlines are made all across here and then you just fill it in like a checkerboard now that can dress up a plane real quickly too and again that's one of the things in years gone by when people used to like it seems like it's a vogue thing now to have checkerboards on everything but that was one of the things that when you used to do the paint by number and, and tape and all, oh, what a mess. This really makes it, and you can't even feel it. It really makes it that anybody can have checkerboards anywhere they want for, uh, well, a minimum amount of effort, work, whatever you want to call it. Now, another thing, when you have lettering like there is on Strega, one of the things you can do is outline the lettering with ink. And, that's pretty much a technique that we've used in the past. We made a plywood template up the shape of the letters, painted in the letters, and then used the plywood template as the substitute for those green uh, drafting guides to put the outline. And then you can move it slightly down and you get a three-dimensional effect, which is kind of neat. And you can see the three-dimensional effect that that leaves. Hey, I guess the checkerboards too. Now another tip when doing semi-scale models is just copy the rivet patterns that are right on a real plane, which is pretty much what we've done here. You can copy a lot of them. For instance, this one has the Zeus fittings on the front, pretty much to scale. And even if you're not doing that model, it'll be similar because that's pretty much the way these planes were all built. They're all built with skins, sections of aluminum. And if you just happen to be copying a, a full scale plane, you can copy some of the lettering. For instance, the real Red Baron has this same lettering on a side of the fuselage. It has the same, the race number five that's in three dimension. Again, a lot of this is done with ink. And it really makes for, uh, it, it can add a nice dimension to an otherwise plain Jane stunt ship. I think Paul's, uh, the previous plane Paul had has 
the most checkerboards of, uh, well, except maybe for Billy Suarez, but again, nice, neat ink work. Look at how he outlined the letters. That's really nice. Another thing Jimmy Casale used to always do, he used to have these stars, these, I call them Fancher stars, they're elongated stars, but one of the things he used to do is when he'd pull a tape up, the edge would always be rough, and he'd take a big, thick, black pen and outline. It was very effective. He put a nice edge on everything. It was really nice. Now, if you look at the Sidewinder, you can see one of the things I did is I simulated those windows that are in Anobla, just to fill in that area from being just blank. And I think that worked real well in keeping with the, the stunt ship look. And of course, the F-16 just had 80 million rivet heads on it. This was, this was, if you ever want to carve something out of one piece of wood, carve that fillet and then blend in that canopy and get all the details in there and then ink it. And you wonder why I'm insane. Now one of the things I always do is I always run out and do a little test to see that the paint is going to dry without fogging up. Roughly an hour or so, we did the cowling too. An hour or so before we do the actual part because we don't want to have some change in humidity come along and dope is very sensitive to humidity and that I would have, have to add retarder or whatever. But in this case, both of the parts have dried real well and it looks like we're gonna be done in time to shoot, if not all of the clear, some of the clear this afternoon. And you can even see, you can even let your set your line reels if you, if you wanna make a lot matching line reel to the plane. This is one of Russ's, he makes a reel for every plane and then just coats it with a couple of coats of clear. This is another case where the, the ink outlines are real effective. And again, you can get some of these from some of the, uh, the aviation books that are for sale. They show the the Reno Air Racers always have really nice lettering jobs. I like dragsters. In this case, it's Tiger De Stephanie's plane. And you can see now these planes, the same amount of detail is on the bottom as on the top. Same amount of labor intensive stuff on both of them. So you did everything in lecture sets. I'd forgotten what a pain they were. <laughs> well, one of the things I learned, and you learn the same thing, is when Nancy or Karen looks at this plane, they're going to find something misspelled. So it's a lot of times it's good to write out all the things you want to ultimately put on the plane and then. At that point in time, spell check them, or have your girlfriend, wife, whatever, spell check it. I'll probably spell Nancy wrong. You know? N-A-N-Z-Y. Right. Anyway, that's something we all do to misspell things or something you just can't avoid. Okay, There's just that's no way. For that. Okay, how many how many more are you going to put on this guy? Are you coming up near the end here? Or? Um, I'm going to put a... Uh, uh, two thank yous on it and um, uh, something under the uh, pilot's name thing and that's all. Okay, so you should be finished with this? In half an hour. Half an hour, so we will get the clear on today then. Um, it's, it's, it's real easy to go too far. Yeah, that's the thing we want to emphasize more than anything else, how easy it is to just put one too many on and all of a sudden it's, oh,
He's releasing pretty well, Ken. These, this particular sheet is perfect. That might be relatively new, that's why. Yeah. That previous sheet was... Those little ones get hard to release when they get old. Oh, yeah. They were right on the edge of being totally unacceptable. Especially going over silk span, that's where you really don't want to have them that they don't want to release. And this is just my little incline Letra set job. Everything nice and nice and neat like it would be on a Reno racer. And never forget to put your wife's name on a plane. You're in big trouble. And don't spell it wrong either. Yeah, that looks good. You can improvise. A lot of this stuff you can just uh, be Mr. Art Lessons here. Yeah, that worked out kind of cool. All right, now we want to go outside, and believe it or not, all day it's been perfectly calm. The wind is howling out there. They must know you're ready to shoot clear. And we want to try to get a coat of clear in the letters, the ink, and possibly on this, possibly on the whole silk span part of the top more than anything else. All of these little guys, anything that has ink on it, we want to get a coat of clear. Let it dry, maybe 15 minutes, and then get a wet coat on the whole plane, or whatever amount of clear we have left in that can. I know we mixed it up. All right, take it outside, baby. It's time. All right, let's take it over there. I don't know where we're gonna spray this. Now let's do it in the driveway. And just wanna get the spots on Electra sets. Then we got the cowling out here drying up ready, and it looks like it's drying real well. Two coats of clear on that. Now while this first coat is drying, Kenny's being a, uh, a human stooge, so to speak. <laughs> hey, nice head. <laughs> anyway, you can see what we did. We have only the cap strips, and only the letters, and only the edges done with a coat of clear. We want this to dry for a uh, good 15, 20 minutes. Is it dry to the touch yet? Uh, get there. Well, let it, let it dry to the touch and then we'll get a little more in it. Just repeat that two or three times. Let each coat dry a little bit. Now while this dope is drying, one of the things Kenny's doing, and it's a good idea to do, is we call it rotisserizing. Just keep moving it in and out of the sun don't hold it in any one dimension, any one time, because the heat can bubble the paint. But if it's constantly moving like this, you get an overall that it, it dries a lot better and you don't run any risk of having a bubble. And with some pretty bright sun here. That sun is bright, there's no doubt about it, Ken. Boy, when you hold that yellow up to the sun, boy, does that, that is really gonna look nice. At least on your wing over pull out, if you miss, everybody's gonna know in, in Oregon they're gonna know. I'll we'll have to get uh, Mike uh, to uh, dig up some more garage candy paint for us. Yeah. Special thanks to Mike Costello for donating the paint on his job. Just keep, as long as you keep it moving, you'll almost never get a bubble. It's when you set it and go walk away. Then the sun kind of gets into one angle and you find a spot and all of a sudden you have a fillet or something will have a bubble. That's one of the best tricks I know. Rotisserize it. We had no wind virtually all day and look at this now. Now that we're out here painting, leaves are blowing, fish are blowing out of the pond. God, unbelievable. How's that drying? To the touch? Can you touch it yet? Touch it like where the tissue is. Just like, barely. All right, if in doubt, give it another 10 minutes and we'll use whatever paint we have left in there up. 
Alright, we're gonna put the hardware in the plane. I just just wanted to buff one little spot out. Everybody knows there's a buffing video. We don't need to go through this, but that paint absolutely buffed out like glass. This and what you did, you left it in the van overnight, oh, all day? In the van two hot days. On a two hot day, sitting out there with the sun cooking that nice dark colored van. And you can see the result is when this is totally buffed, which there's no rush. We want to get it flying this weekend, get some trim flights. That's going to be absolutely gorgeous. Things I do when we're bench trimming a plane, make sure there's no paint on the leadouts because then you get a false reading. Now you want to go to all the hinge things and make sure, remember Rudy Miller's plane, just make sure you can run a piece of 320 sandpaper down there. So you, this is tight. That's pushing it. Hold it on the top and bottom. You want to be able to run that sandpaper through there. Even though you can see through there, you know, Rudy had that little click in his plane. It was making everybody crazy. Then we saw that the paint had built up in there. Even those last coats are clear, build up in there. Okay, just run the sandpaper through the other side. That's perfect. You got no resistance there at all. This one you can see through. It's a lot more clearance. You got more clearance yeah. on that one. Now see if the elevators, these, these are you can see, okay. But even that, just a little bit of binding. Now feel the controls and see how nice they are. I mean, make sure there's nothing. Because once you get out to the field, you're working under battlefield conditions then. Oh. Doing it in here in a shop, it's a, it's a thousand times They're easier. Like glass. Okay, beautiful. All right, let's get the tailwheel wire cleaned up. I'll get the solder on and let's get the tailwheel on. What I always do is I start from one end of the plane, winding up at the nose, because the last thing is we have spinners to cut props for. And if we have any extra time, we can paint some props or whatever. We have to make up a set of uh, wheels for this. But it's, it's, it's better, I think, if you start at one end of the plane and work forward. Or if you start at the front, work to the back. Sometimes you hodgepodge around and you just get confused and waste a lot of time. I'm amazed how that buffed out. That is going to be... And you're not even in the sun here. You're under fluorescence. Now, in keeping with the classic Nobler banner wheel look, I had these, these were part of the tweener package, and I'm going to see if these are appropriate. Kenny's got, Mike Cavell donated a pair of these, am I right? Yeah, Mike Cavell. Dave uh, Browns are always the lightest. You see, the problem with doing a Dave Brown wheel, it, you lose some of the classic look that we're trying to keep on the plane. These would be real nice, but it's a shame to, to and in essence, use up a pair and wear them out flying local contests and stuff. I gotta sell little banners too. Yeah, if you're going to fly in tart, the little ones are fine. But these would be my first choice. And if you wear them out, then put a new pair on. Just see, you can replace the rubber part of these. This is just a Dave Brown rubber these are thing. Two and a half. The two and a half. Okay, yeah. so we could grind them down a little bit. I'll get them down to two and a quarter. But the the part here is you can replace these. These these are just plywood hubs that I made. You could probably peel these right off with a, with a razor blade. See, I made these, Ken, these, these hubs are just made out of light ply, and they come right off. So you can clean them up with a little sandpaper. You solder this on with a flat. Uh -huh. Okay, and then we'll just clean this up. I'll do this over on the, uh, i got to heat it up. And you'll have, in essence, like little hub caps that'll look like banner wheels without having to use up your good banner wheels. Because these you're not going to go find in John's Hobby Shop. Now what I always do... I try to make a little bit of a round contour on the wheel by just ru running it on a little sanding belt. But you don't want to run it straight in. You want to just hold an angle and then wipe it. Like these are, these are still sticky on the hooks. I want to get that loosened up. do that as much as I want to reduce the diameter of the wheel. Okay, while well, I was working on the wheels, Ken got the tail wheel soldered on. Now, a couple of things. See, this is nice and free. Mm -hmm. Use the defluxing. This is bacon, soda, and water. And when you're all done, no matter how ugly it is, put some kind of oil on there. Because how many times you get to the field the next day and the tail wheel doesn't turn? This, this acid from the flux attacks the aluminum and that'll lock up solid. Now you have a plane with a tailwheel that doesn't turn. Just what you need the first day out. 
and we'll trim that off with a parting wheel. By the way, we've been having good luck with, I mentioned these, these are 420s are the thin cutoff wheels and they've what I use to trim cowlings and stuff, but I bought a pack of these too for the, the heavy duty wheels. And these work just exceptional, just unbelievable. They don't break, that's the thing. One of the things I always used to, or you could do it even if you want to just hit this with a soldering gun and just get a round tip or just, if you're going to just rough it up with a file or sandpaper. But when this is like a razor blade, you're wiping a plane off all of a sudden, boom, you got a big cut on your hands. And I've get some oil. I've done it a million times. Yeah, yeah. Seems like an insignificant little detail, but the devil is in the details. Boy, I, I've cut myself so many times rushing. Look at the plane. It's a nice day to go flying. Oh, you get to the field. Oh, God, Jesus. Now you're bleeding all over this nice yellow tissue. All right, and again, tomorrow, well, Saturday when we fly the plane, this will be locked up solid. You can guarantee it. All right, let's get the main wheels on. I took the, I made new bushings. I just took eyelets that I used to secure the bell cranks, file them down so that what happens is to put these little hubs on, let me get this stuff in there, they need to sit flush, so I need to put a real flat solder joint, and then I'll just epoxy that on with some five-minute epoxy. These are nice in the fact that you can buy them and make them. These are just... I have this on video on making these little hubcaps, but but getting old banner wheels is really a problem, and not everybody's willing, to, especially the ones with nylon hubs. Not many people are willing to part with a set of them. Well, luckily we have friends. Yeah. We? What is this, Kimasabi time? <laughs> <laughs> Where the hell's the Long Ranger when we need him? Yeah, that's going to work nice. In two weeks before the Nats, you could put the real banner wheels on. Circle burn a field even. If you fly over all that mud, wear these out. Now, two things. We're going to have to trim this little bit of extra wire off here. So to avoid having those hot little filings go flying off into the paint, you just lay a piece of tin foil or newspaper there. But I pressed the, pressed the wheel up on a hub and backed it out maybe five thousandths, just a little bit. But I'd like to trim that wire flat so that that hub can fit right over there. Okay, you got the tool with... This is that nice heavy parting tool. I'll try to hold this, give you some... Otherwise, the thing wants to chatter. Just go, just go slow. Last time he did this, he cut his finger off. That's the heavy duty wheel. See how that cuts so nice? That's a good one. Doesn't that cut nice? Yeah. Just go slow, you don't have to go faster. Wow, the wire is so hot I can't touch it. Yeah, just burnish it off. Alright, I'm telling you. Let's see if we cut enough off. You got a couple thousands of clearance? Yeah, you got Oh yeah, we got plenty of Okay, clearance. that's good. The important thing is just to get a nice flat solder and join on the eyelet so that I can glue that hub right to the edge of the Dave Brown wheel. Now, of course, the thing to do here is make sure you don't get any on the hub. What we did is we have a little piece of tape to hold them in position. And, of course, you, you just want to babysit while that five minutes kicking off. I think it's going to look nice. Yeah. You pull it apart and see that you have good glue contact. It's good? Yeah, it's really good. All right, good. Alright, give that a minute of just watching it doesn't drop on the floor, we'll have some coffee. Now this one's starting to slip a little bit, so you, until that glue starts to kick off, you got to keep, just keep it. Now if you do this, if you spin the wheel a little and you see it's way off center, you can, you're not going to get it perfect. These aren't made, you know, within a millionth of an inch, but it sure looks better than just having a square wheel that looks like it belongs on a car there.
before we go any further. These are all nice and dry. Get some chain lube down in there. You can only lube them from one, one side, so we don't get... Uh, as always, the camera... The minute you go to put something on camera, they... Uh-oh. President Brodak on the phone. Brodak. And make some money today. I will. <laughs> Here's my $200 a day eating boy can you, here. Can you, can you tape your sister's tape for me? Plywood things. For I would say eighth inch balls will be fine, but make more than one of them just in case. We know the tank shim is going to wind out a nice and tight to vent thing, and we want to ensure that we can get the tank out if we want to change it. Well, you said you have another tank you want to use or try? Yeah, I've got a big gym tank. Okay, so if you CA those in there, and then put some CA over the joint. I'm guessing that's going to be fine. Ball supply, boy, is that nice. Okay, he's got the grain going one way and then reverse the other way. And up here in the plane, you don't need to make everything super light like a piece of paper anyway. Okay, these are just temporary little mounts to hold the tank in while we're finishing this up. We got the tip weight in. We're going to start a little on the heavy side. Kenny's fixing up the box. CLO CA area is up. And we'll That's be ready. Jerry, introduce account? yourself. Jerry Tarnoski from? Uh, Marysville, Ohio. All right. About, uh, Returning to the hobby after how many years? Oh, close to 30. Oh, no. <laughs> Okay, good, and uh, hey, you came to the right place. Next dilemma is we have to figure out we want to get the uniflow vent. In this case, we really only have one choice. We're going to drill right through the motor mount because we want to ensure that we can get the tank in and out. He has other fuel tanks he wants to try. So we're going to try to center it off the motor mount, put a pinhole in there, make sure we're centered, and drill with an eighth-inch drill, put an eyelet on it, pretty much pretty similar to the way we do all the other planes, but let the tube stick in here and then that'll be your uniflow tube. You're going to also have to get one up here as a drain. So let's get that part of it, uh, let's get it started right now. Located with a pinhole, the area of choice to drill an eighth inch hole. Now you're going to have to go try to get it centered right through the motor mount. Yeah, yeah this one's going to be... Right through, yeah. that'll be good. Okay. Okay. What we did is we put, we just drilled eighth inch holes. Now we're going to solder the little eyelets on there. Only need to solder inside and then roughen this area up with the parting wheel so that the epoxy gets a good tooth on both sides of this. You get the other one done? Yeah. Okay. Okay, put a drop of solder on the inside of that and then we'll be ready. We want to get a press fit. I want to have them that they press and they're tight. You don't have a fit where it's dropping and slopping all over the place. Nigga, would you just dip them in there? I just threw them in. Another thing with tank vents, before you put them in, is get all the deburring done so you don't have inside a razor blade that every time you bend the tubing, it's going to put a hole in the tubing and then you go crazy with lean runs. Deflux is good. Then we want to roughen up the spot that's actually going to go through the wood and the motor mounts. This is such a nice press fit. They'll just stick in there. Actually, now we just want to just this amount where the eyelet is. Just get in there with a with a Dremel tool, with any anything really, or even a, a pointy XL blade, so that this is a press fit, nice and f nice and firm. Then we'll get this roughed up before we put the epoxy in, press it in, make sure we don't have any epoxy in the tube, and babysit it for five minutes while it dries. And I didn't want to have these weight right up close to the fuselage, just for the fact that if you if when you take the tubing off, it'll usually run down, and you see planes where there's a big white drip down the side of the fuselage. Starting to look like an airplane, Mr. Ken. If we were to epoxy this in while the surface is smooth, you'd get less of a glue grip. So we take the parting wheel and just put little imperfections in it just to give us a little bit better glue grip. It gives it a little tooth. And just enough to roughen it up. If you ever have one of these come loose out at the field, that day is basically shot. <laughs> All kind, and then there's oil inside, and, it, and the glue never sticks, and it's it's just an ongoing downhill battle from that point on. Okay, what we want to do is with a toothpick saturate the whole inside of these areas, 
Make sure the epoxy is dripping and drilled. Then get them clean so that when you push the tube through, you don't wind up with the end of the tube with a chunk of epoxy in there. That's a thing I've done more than once. Get to the field or go to test run the engine, and all of a sudden, you go to fuel it, and it's like <laughs> you can't fuel a plane. Okay. You want to put some on the vents, too. Where's your little vents? You lose them? Only oh, there momentarily. He is. Okay. Put some glue on there. And what he did, too, another thing is to take some 80 grit paper or whatever and roughen up the tube part inside the body because that tubing, if that slips off, obviously can ruin your whole day. In this tank venting method, there's nothing hard between the tank and the motor. So you should, in, in effect, these, these vents, if you solder a vent to the tank and have these big vents sticking out, almost always fracture in service. This is, I, I don't think there's anybody left in the world that still does it by soldering the vents right to the tank. And what you might want to do, after you get that inserted through this, take a piece of fuel tubing and blow through there. So if there is any epoxy still in there... I'm a he-man. Come on. Come on, be a tough guy. There you go. Clean it up. What, me make removable flaps? And when that epoxy starts to kick off, make a little bead inside where it goes through the fuselage on the inside. Okay, now if we decide to use Uniflow, of course we want to have that option. Get them straight. And guess what we're going to do while the epoxy's kicking off? Da 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 da, where's that pizza pie? Da 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 da. <laughs> Jerry bought everybody in the shop pizza pie today. He said, you guys look all skinny and undernourished. Now let's go out and get fat. All right, just let that dry now. Now, you might think the fish never get hungry. They see us coming out here with pizza. Jerry, you got to feed the fish. <laughs> it's the law. You can't eat pizza without feeding the fish. Feed us pizza. Quit fooling around, Artnowski. We want pizza. Pizza, pizza. I think we came all the way from Ohio to see you. The way this little custom thing worked out with the tank vents here, this looks pretty, pretty custom anyway. And we had to drill a hole so we can get the, uh, the overflow pipe through that. All right, we're ready to mount the motor up here, Mr. Ken? Yeah. Yeah, we have to, we have to drill these motor mounts. You dry fit in the motor right in there, and then we can... Uh, we still have to cut the hole for needle valve yet? What's yes. the last thing? Needle valve hole, okay. That'll be easy. And we gotta cut the spinner up. Now luckily Ken has an unlimited supply of vintage. Oh vintage. Ooh, vintage. However, little known to Ken is that I've uh I've kind of secured one of these onto my own program. <laughs> hey, this is my old oh, spinner. Really? No, that's uh, my old these spinner. are nice. But these are old Vicos. You got all cast ones though, you have no spun ones. No spun. No spawn. No spawn. You're gonna need nose weight anyway. Yeah. Okay. I may as well put a get the other pad. A line and a filter in here. Yep. Put a line and a filter. And get the filter as close to the tank as you can so the cowling doesn't bulge out. Notice how nice this nice toolbox started off the day all nice and neat. Now he's got filters and <laughs> filters and things everywhere. I got everything every place. Oh, it looks like a hobby shop that was hit by a tornado. What kind of filter? You got a thin one? I got one of these little uh, Okay. Yeah, uh, something that's not going to stick out. There's not a whole lot of extra room in that nose. These are hard to find. But this clear jive, smaller diamond. Nah, I'd rather have the red tubing. And just when the cowling goes on, it'll just push that over just yeah, a little bit. Work. Okay. All right. That's good. Of course, being the experts that we are, we never drilled a needle valve hole, so. Ken decided he would like to have a needle valve, so what we did... Now just pick the cowling up and you can see what we did is line up the hole. So you notice it's going to be as accurate as brain surgery. And then reverse it and you can pick up the height or you could measure it with a, with a ruler. And that gives you the height and the other one gives you the front to back. And right, now just drill a pinhole in there. Look in there. Watch this, he's going to go right into his finger. I was drilling an HO train tank car one day with a drill, <laughs> drilled right through one side of my finger and out the other side. Okay, that 
is going to start. Okay. Always make a small hole first, and then you can see if you're too high, too low. Make it the size so the whole tool fits through and then out the other side. Stick a toothpick in and see if you're uh, if you're close or which side is high or low. You can see you want to make so this, exaggerate this the hole the to the high of the side. Circle. We should be right. coming down here. Okay, now you can get a circle template and trace out the circle template on that angle. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. Okay, and we know which dimension we need to get a little bit more clearance on. Okay. All right, and just take the same tool and just very gradually take it out. Go right up to the line. And better to check the fit and go back over three or four times because each time you'll see which side needs a little more clearance. And if you make it too tight, then if you put offset in the motor, it hits the needle valve. So you want to have a little clearance, at least a sixteenth of an inch of clearance. Okay, so we still want to go up toward the exhaust port some. Right. And just use the next bigger circle on the circle template and bias it up in that direction. Nice precision job. Okay, looks good. And it just fits. Okay, now you got to decide what you're going to do about making that little tin piece. So, well, I'm going to uh, take a just a little tiny bit of sandpaper and open this up just a hair. Okay. So the paint doesn't get scratched up. Yeah. This in well, and don't forget the fiberglass won't get oil soaked like wood will too. Yeah. Now we gotta cut the spinners. He's got a real, real Vico cast spinner here, so I gotta drill that out, dremel it, do whatever we can to clean this up a little bit too. Last steps, hopefully last step. Get one of the spinners on here, and you can see the old Vicos they had rough castings, as little things here. We just want to grind this a little bit, try to put a little bit better finish, like a more like a spun finish on here. Already got it cut out for the prop. This is really Stone Age casting at its best. Anyway, we're trying to get out some of the uh, the rough injection marks when they cast these. things really works well is the 3M Ultra Fine. It's a pad they sell for machine shop use for polishing. It doesn't take a long time on a mandrel to really get a nice finish. That's a casting. This is one of the few things that will really give it a nice finish. Very difficult to polish a casting. Anybody that polishes will tell you that. Spinner work that night. That those pads. By the way, our friend Ed Gallagher gave us those pads. They're nice. Really works nice.
as we come to the home stretch of this project. We like it. It's, it looks like it's going to rain any minute. We're trying to rush this through so we can get outside and get the, uh, well, get at least one run on it, a couple runs. Made this little tin in keeping with the nostalgic idea of the plane. Little tin around the exhaust. Pilot saying, let's go, let's go, Middlesex, come on. Got the needle valve for it, we can go out and test run it. Just get a needle valve here before we get all ready to run this and you have to find out the needle valve I don't is in know the, where the needle valve is. You lost the needle valve. What you want perfection? Put a toothpick in there, that'll work. <sighs> After all the Alright. Wet finger, don't have any battery. Need a battery. I don't have a battery. What do you mean you don't? <laughs> And at the end of every flying session, you got to get in there with some rags and towels and Q-tips or whatever. Okay. All right, it's off to Middlesex. To, well, tomorrow. Not tomorrow, but Saturday. Yeah, if the weather's decent tomorrow, I'll run. Now, have you ever noticed on the day you anticipate flying a new plane for the first time, spend an awful lot of time in the outhouse? Well, it certainly looks like it's a nice day, but it's a breezy day. So we're going to cut some lines and try to get all the preliminary stuff ready to uh, see if we can get some flights today. Da 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 da! All right. Okay, you got 015s, you got a ruler. I don't have a ruler. Okay. I have a ruler. You got a bent lead out, boy, that's dangerous. Be careful bending that back, boy. See where that bent? Yeah. Boy, bend that ever so carefully. 
I, uh... That is an accident waiting to happen. Absolutely. Yeah, it's very dangerous. Um... Well, let's go cut lines, even if it's, uh... You know, we got a half hour before we can start a motor. I don't want to say it's time for a new ruler, but... <laughs> Do you know how many sets of lines this ruler has measured? How many times it's been driven over by cars, stepped on? Oh, man. And we still get to use it. A real quality tool. Now, a couple of things I always feel for a first flight, I like to have the line short. These are 015. Yo, 15s, right? Yeah. Okay. 58 feet, center to handle, center to plane. And that should work real well especially well here and at the circle burner field. Then if you have a set of 60 foot lines for open air runway Massachusetts, I think then you're covered on all bases. But always reference center to plane, center to handle as the, as the dimension. A lot of people make the lines 58 feet. That's a mistake. All for right. the first, no, hot rock. Hot rock's much better than that. Just, just to get a preliminary flight. And see if it needs, if it's too touchy or, you know, you got a decent one that's got a little eyelets on there? I got a there. new one. Okay. I'll go get a new one. That's a, that's a good thing, yeah. A couple of tips whenever you're thinking about a brand new plane. Whenever we come to fly somebody's new plane, it basically took them uh, eight, nine months to build. I try not to get too diverted. We try to get here early in the morning. And, of course, be prepared. We started and ran this yesterday in my yard and woke all the neighbors up killed all the squirrels but the purpose of this is I want to concentrate on this it really does look a little too windy to do anything but get some motor runs maybe get some level flights and we'll have to see if the day pans out but we can get all the preparation done and I don't want to get diverted into five ten different things right now I want to be thinking about I'll just give you a perfect example we used to have a friend who used to fly all the time George Higgins and he came down one day bought a set of commercial lines ran them out, didn't even check them, let go of the plane, and they were somehow mismatched. They were 85-foot lines. So that's why, even though this is an old dumpy ruler, no matter how old it gets, the numbers are still in the right spot. Anyway, a little checking, a little prepping. Ken said he went home and balanced the spinner. That was another thing we were a little disappointed. That spinner was a little out of true. Did a little work on the spinner. Make sure the props are balanced. And if nothing else, we'll get, even if the air continues to be uh, real gusty, we'll get some motor runs done. But getting all this prep done, seems like it's a boring thing and you want to just get the plane in the air, but you, you need a little patience to get it done. Now, all these easy just handles, one of my favorites. A couple of things you can do, you can put little eyelets around here to keep this from wearing. This one is not bad, by the way. That's brand new. Yeah, some, but sometimes you see these holes are worn out to where you can't believe it. Now this one looks fine. And that's basically what I patterned my, uh, the original handles I made after. I'm real happy the way they work. This one has the eyelets in it. Oh yeah, yeah, let's show that on a tape. Nice little way you can just epoxy them right in. Now you're probably wondering how do you get it over the cable. Put a slit in it and then just press it back down with the slit off to the side. This will certainly be close enough, and you certainly don't need the big one. I love the way they feel. Nice and light, too. They're a little small for my hand. Well, you got wire cutters? You're yeah. going to need wire? Okay. The one, the one golden rule I always remember about foxes, don't go a whole lot longer than 60 feet. You just don't have the power. Unless you're really, uh, you know, Superman or something. And start 58 because you don't know what kind of air we're going to be experiencing, especially after that club field dries up. I went past there last night. It looked dry, but it wasn't. Story before about old George Higgins. He came up to the field with a set of lines that were marked 70 by 018. They really were 85 by 018. <laughs> Took off at the club field, missed the flagpole by about an inch, almost hit the fence, almost hit the people with scatter and moving things. <laughs> Bad day. Never measured the lines, just took for granted what was written on a label was the true thing. 
Now Ken uses a little bit different technique than I do. He starts at the eyelet. Let me just get a close up if I can out of the sun. You start at the eyelet, work out an inch, and then back yeah. up. Uh huh. Okay. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. I try to do a neat job. Marty's been coming down a field the last couple of weekends. I hope he can somewhere or later he'll show up. Good to have him back. Now what do you do? You make one red and one green? Yeah. Is that the deal? Okay. Yeah. A long time ago someone got me on this red sky green grass thing with red up. <laughs> red sky. <laughs> red sky. Red. Green grass. Anybody out there see red? <laughs> the hell is this guy on drugs? Red sky. Well you know who told me that? Me. Doug Biggs. Oh! <laughs> drugs are everywhere. <laughs> oh my god. Uh... Red sky. I don't believe that. Well, anyway, to each his own. We always there's room for everybody, even people that see the sky oh, I'm, I'm as red. I'm stuck with it now. You know, I'm not going to change. <laughs> yeah, I know. So, I think every step one. Now you want to back up the wire. Right now, I'm going to fold it over and then wrap it back. I think Rudy, I'm just thinking, Rudy Rybeck just had a thing happen too, that he was flying his profile Cardinal, took a set of pre-made lines, ran out to the field and realized they were 70 feet. <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure if they were 70 or 72 or what, I'll have to ask him. That's funny though, that's the kind of stuff, always check, check with a ruler, don't assume. Nice that we have the field all to ourselves while we're getting this ready. Maybe there's a message here. Everybody went swimming and we're out here wrapping lines. They're all doing their homework so they can come out tomorrow. Remember Mike Rogers, he'd wait till the best flying air of the day and then go out and sit in the middle of the circle, tie up the circle for 18 minutes wrapping lines. Everybody is getting ready to throw poison pen letters at him and everything. Yeah, now you see what Mike is remembered for. Mmm. Not for those concourse winning finishes, but for sitting out in a circle when everybody else could be flying. Not for being the party guy. Well, they've changed the rule here. You can't start till 9.30. I think it's a good thing, too, because the people were getting a little uptight about it. When can you start drinking beer? We, we aren't drinking beer yet. <laughs> <laughs> when you go buy it is when we can start. It's wrapped. Okay, and you can just wrap right to the end of the loop. Yeah. All right, good. I will pull test them anyway. Yeah, put it on the handle side first. I always put these, these are fishing, let me show you. This is fishing tubing you buy from a fishing place that sells fishing lures and stuff. And I put that over that cable. And what that does, that keeps that if you ever run out to the handle, you pick up the handle, you haven't checked, and that, that, that clip will go click about halfway through to reverse wing over pull out. It kind of eliminates that. I always use those. Okay, we're coming up on the time we'll be able to start engines. We got the lines all ready to be pull tested here. And it's time. Now, uh, running the engine, Rich, a few, few flights. This is a new engine, and it's certainly in the case of a Fox, you don't want it to shut off in the middle of a flight. Give it two or three good runs. And this is really not a great day to be doing your first AMA stunt pattern. The wind is really, really unbelievable. But we are getting to, and it is in the air. This is the first flight. After eight long months of sanding and buffing and... It sounds like the motor's real coming in nice. This is one that Tom Hampshire massaged over for us. Again, it's always good when you have a new plane to be real safe in the beginning. You can see the wing doing a wing walk here and making, making you crazy. 
air is really, really bumpy here now. It's not a great day. I wouldn't even be wanting to do full stunt patterns or anything, but this part of it we can figure out in which looks like it's flying nice and stable. Even though we calculated it might be a little on a tail heavy side. Certainly doesn't look tail heavy. He's got a four inch easy just 58 foot lines. BY and 0106, which seems to be right in the power range of the motor. No, the truth is he's as nervous as hell. He's trying to be all macho, all tough guy. No, 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 no. Actually, it looks like we got some success here. So nervous he forgot to put his cowboy hat on. I'm not nervous at all. I wish I was Jerry Sipra. <laughs> Glad to see we got this thing in the air finally. Even on a rough day like this. Fox fuel for the first couple flights, I guess for all flights with this engine. <laughs> for a man who spent three quarters of the morning in the outhouse, you'll look pretty happy. Fly, it looks like it flies pretty stable. Yeah, it's a uh, it's a truck. I mean, we thought it was uh, hail heavy. It's king hell nose heavy. Well, take some nose weight out. Take the spinner off. Take the nose weight out. Always safe for the first flight. Wait, I'll give you a hand. Hang on. Rather be safe than sorry. So for the second flight, we're going to take the, uh, the the nose weight out. You got some lead in the back plate too, you said, right? Yeah, I've got an ounce and a half of lead in the back plate. Okay. So we'll probably be take the nose weight off of here first. Taking some of that out. But well, it looked nice and stable. It looked like it was flying nice. I went in two clicks on the needle every run until we get it to break right where we want it. Then don't uh, for now don't fool with the needle. Okay, flight two, we took out about a, an ounce of nose weight. Went in two clicks on the needle, which we're going to do. It looks like we're two clicks away from being right on the money. And again, I want Kenny to be safe as can be because the air really is not pleasant here. And if you look at the wing, you can see the wing dancing in level flight here. Good thing with any new plane, always better safe than sorry. That's the, wow, that's for sure, a big time. Well, it's true, there's a long eight months of a lot of midnight oil, a lot of extra time, a lot of effort to bring this to this point in time, and we don't want to take a chance on having any problems. We're just going to go one step at a time, probably this flight. We'll take a little more nose weight out. I'll see how, it's, how he feels. Go in two more clicks. Mode is almost coming. I would want it to come on just a little bit sooner than that. But it's still a little rich. Two clicks were probably the way for it. And little by little, I hope he'll uh, get over his nervousness. He will. Now 
Now we're near the end of this tape, and I hope you've picked up some good information off it. We're going to continue this on the next tape, see how much we can get done. While we have a day like this where uh, air is kind of crappy. But it's always a pleasure and almost, always a lot of fun being down here at Middlesex, that's for sure. And we did get the plane flying. That was one of the benchmark things we wanted to accomplish today. So, hey, we'll see you on the next tape. Feel better with the nose weight out? Yeah, it feels a lot better with the nose weight out. Do you want to take any more out or you just want to go in on a needle? Uh, I'll think about it for a minute. Okay. Well, I'll go out there and get it. One second. See you on the next tape.